Chapter Ten of Frederick Douglass, a biography by Charles W. Chestnut. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. With the fall of slavery and the emancipation of the colored race, the heroic epoch of Douglass's career may be said to have closed. The text upon which he so long had preached had been expunged from the National Bible, and he had been a one text preacher, a one theme orator. He felt the natural selection which comes with relief from high mental or physical tension, and wondered, somewhat sadly, what he should do with himself, and how he should earn a living. The same considerations, in varying measure, applied to others of the anti-slavery reformers. Some, unable to escape the reforming habit, turned their attention to different social evils, real or imaginary. Others, sufficiently supplied with this world's goods for their moderate wants, withdrew from public life. Douglas was thinking of buying a farm and retiring to rural solitudes, when a new career opened up for him in the Lyceum lecture field. The North was favorably disposed toward colored men. They had acquitted themselves well during the war, and had shown becoming gratitude to their deliverers. Once despised, abolitionists were now popular heroes. Douglas's checkered past seemed all the more romantic in the light of the brighter present, like a novel with a pleasant ending, and those who had hung thrillingly upon his words when he denounced slavery now listened with interest to what he had to say upon other topics. He spoke sometimes on woman suffrage, of which he was always a consistent advocate. His most popular lecture was one on self-made men, another on ethnology, in which he sought a scientific basis for his claim for the Negro's equality with the white man, was not so popular with white people. The wave of enthusiasm which had swept the enfranchised slaves into what seemed at the time the safe harbor of constitutional right was not, after all, based on abstract doctrines of equality of intellect but on an inspiring sense of justice, long dormant under the influence of slavery, but thoroughly awakened under the mortal stress of the war, which conceded to every man the right of a voice in his own government, and the right to an equal opportunity in life to develop such powers as he possessed, however great or small these might be. But Douglas's work in direct behalf of his race was not yet entirely done. In fact, he realized very distinctly the vast amount of work that would be necessary to lift his people up to the level of their enlarged opportunities, and as may be gathered from some of his published utterances, he foresaw that the process would be a long one, and that their friends might weary sometimes of waiting, and that there would be reactions toward slavery which would rob emancipation of much of its value. It was the very imminence of such backward steps, in the shape of various restrictive and oppressive laws, promptly enacted by the old slave states under President Johnson's administration, that led Douglas to urge the enfranchisement of the freedmen. He maintained that in a free country there could be no safe or logical middle ground between the status of freemen and that of serf. There has been much criticism because the Negro, it is said, acquired the ballot prematurely. There seemed imperative reasons, besides that of political expediency, for putting the ballot in his hands. Recent events have demonstrated that this necessity is as great now as then. The assumption that Negroes, under which generalization are included all men of color, regardless of that sympathy to which kinship should at least entitle many of them, are unfit to have a voice in government is met by the words of Lincoln, which have all the weight of a political axiom. No man can be safely trusted to govern other men without their consent. The contention that a class who constitute half the population of a state shall be entirely unrepresented in its councils, because, forsooth, their will there expressed may affect the government of another class of the same general population, is as repugnant to justice and human rights as was the institution of slavery itself. Such a condition of affairs has not the melodramatic and soul-stirring incidents of chattel slavery, 
but its effects can be as far-reaching and as debasing there has been some manifestation of its possible consequences in recent outbreaks of lynching and other race oppression in the south the practical disfranchisement of the colored people in several states and the apparent acquiescence by the supreme court in the attempted annulment by restrictive and oppressive laws of the war amendments to the constitution have brought a foretaste of what might be expected should the spirit of the dred scott decision become again the paramount law of the land on february seventh eighteen sixty six douglas acted as chief spokesman of a committee of leading colored men of the country who called upon president johnson to urge the importance of enfranchisement mr johnson true to his southern instincts was coldly hostile to the proposition recounted all the arguments against it and refused the committee an opportunity to reply the matter was not left with mr johnson however and the committee turned its attention to the leading republican statesmen in whom they found more impressionable material under the leadership of senators sumner wilson wade and others the matter was fully argued in congress the democratic party being in opposition as always in national politics to any measure enlarging the rights or liberties of the colored race in september eighteen sixty six douglas was elected a delegate from rochester to the national loyalist convention at philadelphia called to consider the momentous questions of government growing out of the war while he had often attended anti-slavery conventions as the representative of a small class of abolitionists his election to represent a large city in a national convention was so novel a departure from established usage as to provoke surprise and comment all over the country on the way to philadelphia he was waited upon by a committee of other delegates who came to his seat on the train and urged upon him the impropriety of his taking a seat as a delegate douglas listened patiently but declined to be moved by their arguments he replied that he had been duly elected a delegate from rochester and he would represent that city in the convention a procession of the members and friends of the convention was to take place on its opening day douglas was solemnly warned that if he walked in the procession he would probably be mobbed but he had been mobbed before more than once and had lived through it and he promptly presented himself at the place of assembly his reception by his fellow delegates was not cordial and he seemed condemned to march alone in the procession when theodore tilton at that time editor of the independent paired off with him and marched by his side through the streets of the quaker city the result was gratifying alike to douglas and the friends of liberty and progress he was cheered enthusiastically all along the line of march and became as popular in the convention as he had hitherto been neglected a romantic incident of this march was a pleasant meeting on the street with the daughter of mrs lucretia ald the mistress who had treated him kindly during his childhood on the lloyd plantation the alds had always taken an interest in douglas's career he had indeed given the family a wide though not altogether inevitable reputation in his books and lectures and this good lady had followed the procession for miles that she might have the opportunity to speak to her grandfather's former slave and see him walk in the procession in the convention the ever ready and imperial douglas as colonel higginson describes him spoke in behalf of his race the convention however divided upon the question of negro suffrage and adjourned without decisive action but under president grant's administration the fourteenth amendment was passed and by the solemn sanction of the constitution the ballot was conferred upon the black men upon the same terms as those upon which it was enjoyed by the whites End of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of Frederick Douglass, a biography by Charles W. Chestnut. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It is perhaps fitting 
before we take leave of douglas to give some estimate of the remarkable oratory which gave him his hold upon the past generation for while his labours as editor and in other directions were of great value to the cause of freedom it is upon his genius as an orator that his fame must ultimately rest while douglas's colour put him in a class by himself among great orators and although his slave passed through around him an element of romance that added to his eloquence these were mere incidental elements of distinction the north was full of fugitive slaves and more than once had passionately proclaimed his wrongs there were several coloured orators who stood high in the councils of the abolitionists and did good service for the cause of humanity douglas possessed in large measure the physical equipment most impressive in an orator he was a man of magnificent figure tall strong his head crowned with a mass of hair which made a striking element of his appearance he had deep-set and flashing eyes a firm well-moulded chin a countenance somewhat severe in repose but capable of a wide range of expression his voice was rich and melodious and of great carrying power one writer who knew him in the early days of his connection with the abolitionists says of him in johnson's sketches of lynn he was not then the polished orator he has since become but even at that early date he gave promise of the grand part he was to play in the conflict which was to end in the destruction of the system that had so long cursed his race he was more than six feet in height and his majestic form as he rose to speak straight as an arrow muscular yet lithe and graceful his flashing eye and more than all his voice that rivalled webster's in its richness and in the depth and sonorousness of its cadences made up such an ideal of an orator as the listeners never forgot and they never forgot his burning words his pathos nor the rich play of his humour the poet william howitt said of him on his departure from england in eighteen forty seven he has appeared in this country before the most accomplished audiences who were surprised not only at his talent but at his extraordinary information in ireland he was introduced as the black o'connell a high compliment for o'connell was at that time the idol of the irish people in scotland they called him the black douglas after his prototype in the lady of the lake because of his fire and vigour in rochester he was called the swarthy ajax from his indignant denunciation and defiance of the fugitive slave law of eighteen fifty which came like a flash of lightning to blast the hopes of the anti-slavery people douglas possessed in unusual degree the faculty of swaying his audience sometimes against their mature judgment there is something in the argument from his first principles which if presented with force and eloquence never fails to appeal to those who are not blinded by self-interest or deep-seated prejudice douglas's argument was that of the declaration of independence that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these rights governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed the writer may be pardoned for this quotation for there are times when we seem to forget that now and here no less than in ancient rome eternal vigilance is the price of liberty douglas brushed aside all sophistries about constitutional guarantees and vested rights and inferior races and having postulated the right of men to be free maintained that negroes were men and offered himself as proof of his assertion an argument that few had the temerity to deny if it were answered that he was only half a negro he would reply that slavery made no such distinction and as a still more irrefutable argument would point to his friend samuel r ward who often accompanied him on the platform an eloquent and effective orator of whom wendell phillips said that he was so black that if he would shut his eyes 
no one could see him it was difficult for an auditor to avoid assent to such arguments presented with all the force and fire of genius relieved by a ready wit a contagious humour and a tear-compelling power rarely excelled as a speaker says one of his contemporaries he has few equals it is not a declamation but oratory power of description he watches the tide of discussion and dashes into it at once with all the tact of the forum or the bar he has art argument sarcasm pathos all that first-rate men show in their master efforts his readiness was admirably illustrated in the running debate with captain rinders a ward politician and gambler of new york who led a gang of roughs with the intention of breaking up the meeting of the american anti-slavery society in new york city may seventh eighteen fifty the newspapers had announced the proposed meeting in language calculated to excite riot rinders packed the meeting with rowdies and himself occupied a seat on the platform some remark by mr garrison the first speaker provoked a demonstration of hostility when this was finally quelled by a promise to permit one of the rinders party to reply mr garrison finished his speech he was followed by a prosy individual who branded the negro as brother to the monkey douglas perceiving that the speaker was wearying even his own friends intervened at an opportune moment captured the audience by a timely display of wit and then improved the occasion by a long and effective speech when douglas offered himself as a refutation of the last speaker's argument rinders replied that douglas was half white douglas thereupon greeted rinders as his half-brother and made this expression the catchword of his speech when rinders interrupted from time to time he was silenced with a laugh he appears to have been a somewhat philosophic scoundrel with an appreciation of humour that permitted the meeting to proceed to an orderly close douglas's speech was the feature of the evening that gifted man said garrison in whose life and times a graphic description of this famous meeting is given effectually put to shame his assailants by his wit and eloquence a speech delivered by douglas at concord new hampshire is thus described by another writer he gradually let out the outraged humanity that was laboring in him in indignant and terrible speech there was great oratory in his speech but more of a dignity and earnestness than what we call eloquence he was an insurgent slave taking hold on the rights of speech and charging on his tyrants the bondage of his race in holland's biography of douglas extracts are given from letters of distinguished contemporaries who knew the orator colonel t w higginson writes thus i have hardly heard his equal in grasp upon an audience in dramatic presentation in striking at the pith of an ethical question and in single illustrations and examples another writes in reference to the impromptu speech delivered at the meeting at rochester on the death of lincoln i have heard webster and clay in their best moments channing and beecher in their highest inspirations i have never heard truer eloquence i never saw a profounder impression the published speeches of douglas of which examples may be found scattered throughout his various autobiographies reveal something of the powers thus characterized though like other printed speeches they lose by being put in type but one can easily imagine their effect upon a sympathetic or receptive audience when delivered with flashing eye and deep-toned resonant voice by a man whose complexion and past history gave him the highest right to describe and denounce the iniquities of slavery and contend for the rights of a race in later years when brighter days had dawned for his people and age had dimmed the recollection of his sufferings and tempered his animosities he became more charitable to his old enemies but in the vigour of his manhood with the memory of his wrongs and those of his race fresh upon him he possessed that indispensable quality of the true reformer 
he went straight to the root of the evil and made no admissions and no compromises slavery for him was conceived in greed born in sin cradled in shame and worthy of utter and relentless condemnation he had the quality of directness and simplicity when collins would have turned the abolition influence to the support of a communistic scheme douglas opposed it vehemently slavery was the evil they were fighting and their cause would be rendered still more unpopular if they ran after strange gods when garrison pleaded for the rights of man when phillips with golden eloquence preached the doctrine of humanity in progress men approved and applauded when parker painted the moral baseness of the times men acquiesced shamefacedly when channing preached the gospel of love they wished the dream might become a reality but when douglas told the story of his wrongs and those of his brethren in bondage they felt that here indeed was slavery embodied here was an argument for freedom that could not be gainsaid that the race that could produce in slavery such a man as frederick douglas must surely be worthy of freedom what douglas's platform utterances in later years lacked of the vehemence and fire of his earlier speeches they made up in wisdom and mature judgment there is a note of exultation in his speeches just after the war jehovah had triumphed his people were free he had seen the red sea of blood open and let them pass and engulf the enemy who pursued them among the most noteworthy of douglas's later addresses were the oration at the unveiling of the free men's monument to abraham lincoln in washington in eighteen seventy six which may be found in his life and times the address on decoration day new york eighteen seventy eight his eulogy on wendell phillips printed in austin's life and times of wendell phillips and the speech on the death of garrison june eighteen seventy nine he lectured in the parker fraternity course in boston delivered numerous addresses to gatherings of colored men spoke at public dinners and women's suffrage meetings and retained his hold upon the interest of the public down to the very day of his death end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of Frederick Douglass, a biography by Charles W. Chestnut. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. With the full enfranchisement of his people, Douglass entered upon what may be called the third epoch of his career, that of fruition. Not every worthy life receives its reward in this world, but Douglass, having fought the good fight, was now singled out by virtue of his prominence for various honors and emoluments at the hands of the public he was urged by many friends to take up his residence in some southern district and run for congress but from modesty or some doubt of his fitness which one would think he need not have felt and the consideration that his people needed an advocate at the north to keep alive there the friendship and zeal for liberty that had accomplished so much for his race he did not adopt the suggestion in eighteen sixty douglas moved to washington and began or took over the publication of the new national era a weekly paper devoted to the interests of the colored race the venture did not receive the support hoped for and the paper was turned over to douglas's two oldest sons lewis and frederick and was finally abandoned in eighteen seventy four douglas having sunk about ten thousand dollars in the enterprise later newspapers for circulation among the colored people have proved more successful and it ought to be a matter of interest that the race which thirty years ago could not support one publication edited by its most prominent man now maintains several hundred newspapers which make their appearance regularly in eighteen seventy one douglas was elected president of the freedman's bank this ill-starred venture was then apparently in the full tide of prosperity and promised to be a great lever in the uplifting of the submerged race douglas soon after his election as president 
discovered the insolvency of the institution and insisted that it be closed up the negro was in the hands of his friends and was destined to suffer for their mistakes as well as his own other honors that fell to douglas were less empty than the presidency of a bankrupt bank in eighteen seventy he was appointed by president grant a member of the santo domingo commission the object of which was to arrange terms for the annexation of the mulatto republic to the union some of the best friends of the colored race among them senator sumner opposed this step but douglas maintained that to receive santo domingo as a state would add to its strength and importance the scheme ultimately fell through whether for good or ill of santo domingo can best be judged when the results of more recent annexation schemes eighteen ninety eight puerto rico guam the philippines hawaii and de facto cuba became apparent douglas went to santo domingo on an american man-of-war in the company of three other commissioners in his life and times he draws a pleasing contrast between some of his earlier experiences in travelling and the terms of cordial intimacy upon which as the representative of a nation which a few years before had denied him a passport he was now received in the company of able and distinguished gentlemen on his return to the united states douglas received from president grant an appointment as member of the legislative council or upper house of the legislature of the district of columbia where he served for a short time until other engagements demanded his resignation one of his sons being appointed to fill out his term to this appointment douglas owed the title of honorable subsequently applied to him in eighteen seventy two douglas presided over and addressed a convention of colored men at new orleans and urged them to support president grant for renomination he was elected a presidential elector for new york and on the meeting of the electoral college in albany after grant's triumphant re-election received a further mark of confidence and esteem in the appointment at the hands of his fellow electors to carry the sealed vote to washington douglas sought no personal reward for his services in this campaign but to his influence was due the appointment of several of his friends to higher positions than had ever theretofore been held in this country by colored men when r b hayes was nominated for president douglas again took the stump and received as a reward the honorable and lucrative office of marshal of the united states for the district of columbia this appointment was not agreeable to the white people of the district whose sympathies were largely pro-slavery and an effort was made to have its confirmation defeated in the senate the appointment was confirmed however and douglas served his term of four years in spite of numerous efforts to bring about his removal in eighteen seventy nine the hard conditions under which the negroes in the south were compelled to live led to a movement to promote an exodus of the colored people to the north and west in the search for better opportunities the white people of the south alarmed at the prospect of losing their labor were glad to welcome douglas when he went among them to oppose this movement which he at that time considered detrimental to the true interests of the colored population under the garfield administration douglas was appointed in may eighteen eighty one recorder of deeds for the district of columbia he held this very lucrative office through the terms of presidents garfield and arthur and until removed by president cleveland in eighteen eighty six having served nearly a year after cleveland's inauguration in eighteen eighty nine he was appointed by president harrison as minister resident and consul general to the republic of haiti in which capacity he acted until eighteen ninety one when he resigned and returned permanently to washington the writer has heard him speak with enthusiasm of the substantial progress made by the haitians in the arts of government and civilization and with indignation of what he considered slanders against the island due to ignorance or prejudice 
when it was suggested to douglas that the haitians were given to revolution as a mode of expressing disapproval of their rulers he replied that a four years rebellion had been fought and two presidents assassinated in the united states during a comparatively peaceful political period in haiti his last official connection with the black republic was at the world's columbian exposition at chicago in eighteen ninety three where he acted as agent in charge of the haitian building and the very credible exhibit therein contained his stately figure which age had not bowed his strong dark face and his head of thick white hair made him one of the conspicuous features of the exposition and many a visitor took advantage of the occasion to recall old acquaintance made in the stirring anti-slavery days in eighteen seventy eight he revisited the lloyd plantation in maryland where he had spent part of his youth and an affecting meeting took place between him and thomas ald whom he had once called master once in former years he had been sought out by the good lady who in his childhood had taught him to read nowhere more than in his own accounts of these meetings does the essentially affectionate and forgiving character of douglas and his race become apparent and one cannot refrain from thinking that a different state of affairs might prevail in the southern states if other methods than those at present in vogue were used to regulate the relations between the two races and their various admixtures that make up the southern population in june eighteen seventy nine a bronze bust of douglas was erected in sibley hall of rochester university as a tribute to one who had shed lustre on the city in eighteen eighty two occurred the death of douglas's first wife whom he had married in new york immediately after his escape from slavery and who had been his faithful companion through so many years of stress and struggle in the same year his life and times was published in eighteen eighty four he married miss helen pitts a white woman of culture and refinement there was some criticism of this step by white people who did not approve of the admixture of the races and by colored persons who thought their leader had slighted his own people when he overlooked the many worthy and accomplished women among them but douglas to the extent that he noticed these strictures at all declared that he had devoted his life to breaking down the color line and that he did not know any more effectual way to accomplish it that he was white by half his blood and as he had given most of his life to his mother's race he claimed the right to dispose of the remnant as he saw fit the latter years of his life were spent at his beautiful home known as cedar hill on anacostia heights near washington amid all that which could accompany old age as honor love obedience troops of friends he possessed strong and attractive social qualities and his home formed a mecca for the advanced and aspiring of his race he was a skilful violinist and derived great pleasure from the valuable instrument he possessed a wholesome atmosphere always surrounded him he had never used tobacco or strong liquors and was clean of speech and pure in life he died at his home in washington february twenty eighteen ninety five he had been perfectly well during the day and was supposed to be in excellent health he had attended both the forenoon and afternoon sessions of the women's national council then in session at washington and had been a conspicuous figure in the audience on his return home while speaking to his wife in the hallway of his house he suddenly fell and before assistance could be given he had passed away his death brought forth many expressions from the press of the land reflecting the high esteem in which he had been held by the public for a generation in various cities meetings were held at which resolutions of sorrow and appreciation were passed and delegations appointed to attend his funeral in the united states senate a resolution was offered reciting that in the person of the late frederick douglass death had borne away a most illustrious citizen 
and permitting the body to lie in state in the rotunda of the capital on sunday the immediate consideration of the resolution was asked for mr gorman of maryland the state which douglas honored by his birth objected and the resolution went over douglas's funeral took place on february twenty five eighteen ninety five at the metropolitan african methodist episcopal church in washington and was the occasion of a greater outpouring of colored people than had taken place in washington since the unveiling of the lincoln emancipation statue in eighteen seventy eight the body was taken from cedar hill to the church at half past nine in the morning and from that hour until noon thousands of persons including many white people passed in double file through the building and viewed the body which was in charge of a guard of honor composed of members of a colored camp of the sons of veterans the church was crowded when the services began and several thousands could not obtain admittance delegations one of them a hundred strong were present from a dozen cities among the numerous floral tributes was a magnificent shield of roses orchids and palms sent by the haitian government through its minister another tribute was from the son of his old master among the friends of the deceased present were senator sherman and hoar justice harlan of the supreme court miss susan b anthony and miss may wright sewell president of the women's national council the temporary pallbearers were ex-senator b k bruce and other prominent colored men of washington the sermon was preached by rev j g jennifer john e hutchinson the last of the famous hutchinson family of abolition singers who with his sister accompanied douglas on his first voyage to england sang two requiem solos and told some touching stories of their old-time friendship the remains were removed to douglas's former home in rochester where he was buried with unusual public honors in november eighteen ninety four a movement was begun in rochester under the leadership of j w thompson with a view to erect a monument in memory of the colored soldiers and sailors who had fallen during the civil war this project had the hearty support and assistance of douglas and upon his death the plan was changed and a monument to douglas himself decided upon a contribution of one thousand dollars from the haitian government and an appropriation of three thousand dollars from the state of new york assured the success of the plan september fifteenth eighteen ninety eight was the date set for the unveiling of the monument but owing to delay in the delivery of the statue only part of the contemplated exercises took place the monument complete with the exception of the statue which was to surmount it was formally turned over to the city the presentation speech being made by charles p lee of rochester a solo and chorus composed for the occasion were sung an original poem read by t thomas fortune and addresses delivered by john c dancy and john h smith joseph h douglas a talented grandson of the orator played a violin solo and miss susan b anthony recalled some reminiscences of douglas in the early anti-slavery days in june eighteen ninety nine the bronze statue of douglas by sidney w edwards was installed with impressive ceremonies the movement thus to perpetuate the memory of douglas had taken rise among a little band of men of his own race but the whole people of rochester claimed the right to participate in doing honor to their distinguished fellow-citizen the city assumed a holiday aspect a parade of military and civic societies was held and an appropriate program rendered at the unveiling of the monument governor roosevelt of new york delivered an address and the occasion took on a memorable place in the annals of rochester of which city douglas had said i shall always feel more at home there than anywhere else in this country in march eighteen ninety five 
a few weeks after the death of Douglas, Theodore Tilton, his personal friend for many years, published in Paris, of which city he was then a resident, a volume of sonnets to the memory of Frederick Douglass, from which the following lines are quoted as the estimate of a contemporary and a fitting epilogue to this brief sketch of so long and full a life. I knew the noblest giants of my day, and he was of them strong amid the strong, but gentle too, for though he suffered wrong, yet the wrongdoer never heard him say, Thee also do I hate. A lover's lay, no dirge, no doleful requiem song, is what I owe him, for I loved him long, as dearly as a younger brother may. Proud is the happy grief with which I sing, for, O oh my country, in the paths of men, there never walked a grander man than he. He was a peer of princes, yea, a king, crowned in the shambles and the prison pen, the noblest slave that ever God set free. End of chapter 12 Recording by Kirk Ziegler, Lake Placid, Florida End of Frederick Douglass, a biography by Charles W. Chestnut